Welcome to Que Sara Sara, a podcast hosted by me, Sarah Ann Lalone. Join me as I go straight to the sources of my curiosity. Each episode, I get to discover or rediscover everyday educators as we discuss their passions and their projects. Listen in on our conversation and let our words spark imagination and inspiration. You're listening to episode 93 with Erin Lagiel, teaching as performance. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, I am having a returning guest. Yes, you've probably read in the episode name that tonight I am speaking with Aaron Langeau, and he's coming in all the way from the great north of Ontario, um, from Sudbury. And if you listen to back when I was just a a beginner podcaster, episode 39. It feels like forever ago, back when I was an, uh, like a student at the Faculty of Education, Aaron and I spoke about uh, gamification and how to gamify your classroom. Definitely, I want to say one of my like top five favorite episodes because it was such a topic that I was interested about and that I knew nothing about. So I feel like I I gained a lot from that, from that episode. It was a lot of fun. Um, But now this time he is back for like a new and exciting topic. So I'm really excited um, that Aaron's here. He is a professor at Laurentian University. We um, worked a little bit with liaison services together and chatted a lot when I was, uh, you know, doing my bachelor's degree there. And he teaches everything from game design to computer science. And I will let you, Aaron, kind of give our listeners a a very brief little spark notes background on yourself. Oh boy. That sounds like a lot of pressure. Um, (laughs) Like a Twitter bio, you know? Like a Twitter bio, (laughs) 280 characters or less. Yeah, Um, I'll be counting. Well, it's, everything you said was true. Um, I am a master lecturer at Laurentian University, which makes me kind of a teaching stream uh, professor. And per, primarily, I teach computer science, and I dabble a little bit in video game design. My research is um, in things like uh, representation in video games, um, sort of how we tackle difficult subjects in video games. I also dabble a little bit in environmental simulation, uh, which is what some of my degrees are in. And uh, somewhere along the way, I started working on uh, what we would call scholarship of teaching and learning. Um, so sort of the the theory that we don't always get as university professors on uh, how people learn and how to engage people. So a lot of my work recently is in that neck of the woods. How to engage people, man. Mm -hmm. But particularly learners. Right, right. And I think it was really interesting when we were talking like in in, 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 um, Twitter DMs about, you know, what the topic of this conversation was going to be and you mentioned that one of the one of the talks that you're giving uh is called teaching as performance and before we press record on the podcast you were briefly kind of you know explaining where that where this talk stems from and i i want to dive into that um and i in in reading the articles that you sent me about the talk um it's interesting how teaching as performance links directly to uh, student engagement and and all of that fun stuff. So I have 1 million questions buzzing around in my head right now. I will let you kind of give us again just like a just like an overview of what the heck is teaching as performance because when people like when I first read that I was almost like confused and curious. So I want to know what's your take on it and where does it stem from? Um, so where I got it from um, was a tweet. So I'm, I'm fairly active on Twitter, uh, as you know, for <laughs> sure. Um, and a tweet sort of drifted past my timeline uh, by somebody who I follow who's a teacher in the United States. He's a post-secondary teacher. His name is Jesse Stommel. 
And um, I'll, I'll read you the tweet in case um, your listeners don't have access to Twitter. It basically says, acting training should be a component of all teacher preparation, voice control, public performance, improv, um, also communication skills, active listening, nonverbal communication, lecturing, facilitating discussion, orchestrating active learning. These are skills, not magic. And <laughs> um, the interesting thing uh, that happens, at least to me on Twitter from time to time, is something like that will we'll wander through my timeline and it'll make me stop and reflect on sort of the things that I do inside my own classroom. and. Um, you know, this was definitely one of those where as soon as I saw it, I kind of thought, I wonder if I do any of those things. And, uh, you know, after a couple of weeks of sort of rolling around in my head, I kind of thought, yeah, I, I really do actually um, do a lot of the things that Jesse was talking about, even though I've had no acting training at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the things that my students appreciate in my particular classes is the performance elements that I didn't really know how to capture or to articulate until the, I started, you know, reflecting on my own practices because of this tweet. Um, I'll be I'll be honest, and it might sound kind of weird, but this is actually one of the more controversial talks that I give. Um, I've only done it a couple of times, but um, the first time I delivered the the talk that you're referring to was in. I think it was uh, spring of last year at Laurentian's Teaching and Learning Days, and I wanted to do something new. I had done mm -hmm. gamification a few times. I've done open educational resources a few times. And I really, I, I found this to be a really engaging topic for me. And I wanted to to see, you know, how my <laughs> colleagues would respond yeah. to, to this kind of idea. And it was a bit rough, to be honest, because there are a lot of people who kind of question whether or not we should portray ourselves as entertainers um, in the classroom, as opposed to just delivering content and making the content be the only focus. So mm -hmm. it is an oddly controversial topic when you say to, to somebody, maybe particularly in the post-secondary um, sphere like yeah you know you can add performance elements and engage your students at a deeper level um it's something that not everybody is keen to do yeah or comfortable because when when i looked at all the elements no before i looked at the elements and i just seen the title teaching as performance i was like oh my i would never consider myself as an actor anyone who likes to be anyone but myself. And I kind of took it as like, when I'm a teacher, do I need to be like, you know, somebody that I'm not like performing, you know, actors who play a certain character or a certain role, it doesn't necessarily portray who they really are. And I was, that was kind of like the take that I took on it before really diving into like all the, the components. Um, and then that made me like really uneasy, but when you frame it in the way of you know, the actual delivery of the content and the reason behind the delivery. Like you don't have to be someone you're not to deliver content in like a, a more fun and interactive and engaging way. Right. It's yeah. just to like, yeah, for sure, put the effort into knowing the strategies and ways to deliver the content. And, and sorry, the French expression may come de se to, yeah. to make it your own. Right. Right. I think the interesting part is, and, and the part that is tough for people to sort of wrap their heads around at first, is that we already become someone else when we get in front of the classroom. Um, hmm. You know, our teaching persona is rarely who we are when we're at home or when we're out socializing. Like, it's very common for us to, to put on... Uh, or to kind of shift the way we act, the you know that that sort of outward facing version of us, depending on where we are. So we actually already kind of do it. And 
Mm. You know, it, it could be as simple as becoming serious when you're in front of the classroom because you're looking um, to, to command that respect from your students and make sure that they're paying attention. Like it's, it can right, be as right, simple right. as that. Right. Now, okay. the, we tend to do that already. What, what Jesse, um, and, and I guess by some weird extension, um, what I'm also sort of advocating is that part of that persona that we put on, um, part of the, the tools in our, in our teaching toolbox can be things that are actually pretty straightforward that, that don't involve us, you know, becoming an entirely different, unrecognizable person, but can just mm. capture somebody's attention in a more engaging way than maybe the persona that we have now. Um, that that right. doesn't use these particular techniques, and it, it's not. I certainly don't advocate for uh, becoming a class clown or um, mm-hmm. you know losing sight of the content because we're so busy um, trying to tell jokes or to juggle apples in front of our mm-hmm. students. It's more along the lines of here are a handful of techniques that actually can help you grab their attention and hold on to it a little bit better. So can you? like define what the word performance actually means in teaching as performance because again maybe some of the, your colleagues or people who who read this think like well I'm not good at performing so does that mean that I'm not a good teacher like what does that <laughs> you know what I mean yeah I do I really do because this is where the controversy comes in um and you know we as teachers, whether you're in primary grades, high school, post-secondary, like we really always put ourselves on the line anyhow. Um, mm. and, and again, I, I, I really want people to already think of themselves as, you know, a certain kind of performer, um, whether you happen to be using the techniques that are discussed in the talk or in the article, which um, I imagine we'll pick on a few of them in a little bit. Um, we're already doing some of those things at, at, a, at a smaller extent. So in terms of what does performance mean uh, with respect to teaching, uh, I, I want to I kind of steer away from, you know, that, that notion that we become an entirely different um, person. And it, it's more along the lines of what can we learn from the same kind of training that actors get? And it's it's not about it's not about wearing a mask. It's not about um, becoming a character actor. Like thinking think about some of the great character actors that are out there that can just sort of chameleon themselves into an entirely different persona. It's not about walking in and being an opera star one day and being a stand up comedian another day and being sort of a dramatic um, persona the the next day. It's more about what do what do we teach performers that we can use in the practice of teaching? So it, it's not it, it's more of a loose uh, teaching as performance. Mm-hmm. It, it probably could be rebranded as um, the performance aspects of teaching. Ooh, I feel like that's less uh... <laughs> less intimidating. Yeah, less intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah, for sure. And and then again, it's it's oddly controversial because people uh, do they feel attacked by it? Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, it's it's funny that you say that because when I read the article from UBC, you know about this uh, this talk, like you just talked about nervousness, and it, it explains that these elements of performance was a way to diminish your nervousness and uncertainty in front of the students. So like, how does that make any sense? Yeah. So it's kind of, and and I was very, very careful in um, my talk at UBC to say, you know, I didn't actually start out trying to engage students. Um, I, when I started about 12 or 13 years ago, um, I didn't really know anything about engaging students. And I really just wanted to survive each lecture so that I could go on to teach the next lecture the following week <laughs> or later on in the week. I mean, in I, I remember being in grade school and participating in public speaking contests and just 
being on stage thinking I was going to perish. Like there was no way I was ever going to become a public speaker for mm -hmm. a living, which is what I am. I, there's no question. Some of my classes have 200 students. Um, I have a bi-weekly radio column on CBC. Like I am talking to people almost all the time. And it, I'm, I'm only as comfortable now in front of people as I am because of all of the practice that I've had. Yeah. I mean, I've taught, you know, hundreds of lectures in front of hundreds of people. Um, and that tends to, you know, with practice and, and with some self-reflection, you tend to get a little bit better at it and control those nerves. But like a lot of the things that the tweet mentions, like voice control, um, improvisation, I started actually using those things without even knowing what I was doing mm. as ways to protect me yeah, from self -preservation. the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was exactly a self-preservation mechanism. I would, uh, I would, I was always looking for ways to not feel so, what do, how do I want to say this? Uh, to not feel so... <laughs> isolated in front of the classroom. I felt, you know, there were times at the beginning um, where I wasn't sure that I could do this at all. And anything that went wrong in my lecture kind of scared me. I didn't know how to recover. Kind of like mm. when you are in public school and you're doing those speeches on stage and you forget a line. Like, how do oh. you recover from that when you're in grade six, seven, or eight? And here I was, you know, 30, and running into the same problems in front of my oh class. Oh my, I have because, goosebumps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think most teachers have experienced that that feeling of dread when you go to show something and it doesn't work properly, or you state something that you think is a fact and your students all look at you and shake their head and go, no, that's actually wrong. Um, like, how do you recover from that? So for me, almost all of the techniques that I discussed um, at UBC and at Laurentian the spring before were self-preservation techniques. And only a decade later did I realize that the things that I, were, I was doing for me, um, those same things were also engaging the students. So it, it hmm. really was a roundabout way to come to this idea of performance elements in my teaching. Uh, but at first they were just there to safeguard me from embarrassment. Wow. I feel as though as a new teacher, and I just want to like share this quick point, and then we're going to dive into like the, the, the more concrete, like strategies that you um, have laid out. So, so neatly for us here. Um, but as a new teacher, I, 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 felt all of those those ways of like fear of not you know saying the right thing or not saying a, a certain fact or not you know or just having students look at me like we don't care what you're saying and you know I'm just gonna my phone is way more entertaining kind of thing um especially again so yeah as a new teacher teaching a history class or a geography class that I'm not necessarily uh you can say an expert in I I found one of my self-preservation strategies was like just being super open and vulnerable with my students like extremely open to the point where we were able to kind of break down the walls of like I'm the teacher the know all tell all and you're the students you know nothing and we were able to create that kind of like relationship where we could co-learn together and I those expectations of me knowing everything just kind of like left and that was only because I was able to not admit that I didn't know everything but I wasn't going to stand up high on a pedestal and say listen to me I know it all because I guess I was just more aware of everything that I didn't know than what I did know and I could not have survived if I would have like faked it you know they say fake it till you make it but i couldn't have done that <laughs> yeah and nothing about um nothing that's in my set of tips is a, is a fake it till you make it thing at all in mm -hmm. fact i i would argue that um a lot of what um the the six or seven i can't remember how many points there are um a lot of the the points that are in the slides that are in the talk actually punctuate that kind of vulnerability um 
it's a lot of them are ways of embracing that. And I think a lot of times tying this back to performance, a lot of times the actors that we um, connect with the most are the ones where we see their vulnerability. Mm. And so I think you're making an excellent point. And I think that that's another strategy. And all of these are just tools in the teaching toolbox. And, you know, some of the, the of the six points that I give in the talk, maybe only two of them work for, for a particular person. Maybe somebody's able to embrace all six of them. You know, maybe for somebody it's one, but each one has its own importance. Each one has its own way of engaging the students and right. you know making it seem like you're actually a real person because i i don't <laughs> believe that the tips are designed to make you seem fake or not real i think that they're they're actually designed to help you be real in front of the students and i think the other point that you make is um like if you're first starting out as a teacher you may not want to consider any of these tips right now you may just want to spend a year or two doing that surviving thing mm -hmm. and then you know like you need to get to know yourself right first for sure and getting yeah. to know your material as well mm. because none of these things work if you don't know your content you know none of the performance elements can cover for not knowing what it is that you want to deliver to the students that they're all totally they're all fair. supplements yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. good point, actually. Hmm. Okay, so let's do. We'll 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 go from uh, voice dynamics all the way down to improv. Um, <laughs> and I I want to. No matter how long this episode goes for, I want to <laughs> touch upon each of them. I think they're so interesting and so important, and I want to hear what you have to say. So the first one is voice dynamics, and it kind of looks at obviously your tone and one of the points that you have in your um in your slides here is like recording yourself and your lectures and when i read that i almost got like this pit in my stomach thinking <laughs> about having to hear myself teach because Aaron i don't even listen to my podcast or i have a really hard time listening back to my own podcasts so yeah. i don't know do you, is and, this something you do a strategy well, Okay, so let's let's talk about the voice dynamics. Let's start okay, there. okay, okay, sorry. Um, so, so no, it's it's cool. It, it, it there's a lot sort of to unpack. Um, the voice, your voice is your first key to your students. Like it's not there's there isn't anything that should come before your voice. Like even if the students' eyes are closed, even if they're not paying attention, um, your voice is your 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 primary connection to the majority of your students, and um, you know it is almost always the most effective way to show your enthusiasm for what you're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. So whether it's history, geography, computer science, French, it doesn't matter. Um, your enthusiasm comes across first um, through your voice. And I think when I talk to people about how to work on voice, um, I mean, think back to the teachers that you had at, at any level of education that had that really monotone voice, sort of the Ferris Bueller kind of, you know, always speaking in the same tone. And you, you remember those professors, you remember those teachers um, as not having captured your attention. And, and it's okay if you are one of those teachers, because you can actually learn to be more dynamic. Um, and I, I really do think that the, the, the most effective way is to listen to your own voice. And when I first started doing this, um, I can remember the hairs on the back of my neck standing mm. up. Um, but where I, where I did this, where I had the opportunity to do this was in my own um, sort of quote unquote podcast through the CBC because they save all of the episodes. Um, mm -hmm. And I decided that I was going to save all the episodes. And so for each episode, I would have to go and download it. And I always had to press play uh, to make sure I was, I was downloading the right episode. And I would hear my own voice. And every once in a while, 
um, I would get a comment on an episode about something I said. And I don't, you know, the, the podcast there, sorry, the, the radio show happens early in the morning um, I, by noon or, or five o'clock at night. I don't always remember what I said. So I would go back and I would re-listen. And after doing this, you know, maybe a dozen times, that cringing stopped. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm in love with the sound of my own voice. Um, some people might argue that I am because I talk a lot, but you know, I can, I can, I'll use a, I'll use a rough word. I can tolerate my own voice a lot more than I could in the past. And what's important about that is I listen to those original radio broadcasts. And I listen to the new ones, the most recent ones, and I can tell how far I've come with how much more comfortable my voice is, how much, how many more dynamics I can get in, even on the radio, um, because I listened to the original ones um, so many times. And while, you know, almost everybody that listens to this is going to go, I don't want to listen to my own voice, we don't actually improve at, at anything without practice. Yeah. And I think listening to how dynamic maybe you already are, you know, maybe you record it and you play it back and you go, I actually am really dynamic. I don't think I have a lot to improve on. Um, or maybe you listen and you think I am actually quite monotone. And I wonder if my students would respond more if I change the pitch of my voice more or occasionally I'll whisper in class and I'll mm -hmm. see everybody sort of sit on the edge of their seats and then I will say something really loud to get their attention um, so it can be a volume thing it can be a pitch thing um, you know I, I have been known to sing in class and I'm not a singer um, but I have become <laughs> more comfortable um, with that kind of a performance element uh, and it can be fun it can, it, it's again, part of that vulnerability that we were talking about. Um, and the students see it and they see the effort and they see what you're trying to do and they tend to respond. But listening to yourself can be really hard. Um, and it's kind of like a bandaid. You just have to rip it off. And after you do that a few times, you know, if you're like me, it goes away. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I feel like I've just been challenged with like indirectly. Oh, <laughs> and for I sure. Wanna... You gotta you gotta listen to all your old podcasts. You gotta go oh. through all those things. Yeah. It it always like sounds like a good idea to do it, you know? It's cool <laughs> and I can re-listen and like, you know, relearn a whole bunch of things and old conversations. It's just hard, but again, I I strongly believe in you need to like in order to learn and be better you need to like reflect and actually do the work as in hear where you're at and reflect on where you need to be and how you can improve mm -hmm. so you know it'd be like listen to one podcast a week sarah i think that's a, an attainable goal because right now i'm at zero podcasts a week that i listen to like you know of my own voice so. Yeah. And, and uh, another tip would be if there are some podcasts that you're particularly fond of, listen to them, um, mm. because then you're not just listening to your own voice. You're also listening to the content that you enjoy. So it, it makes it a little bit more palatable when you're listening to something that you actually want to listen to. Um, and then your voice just becomes kind of a secondary feature, but you can still kind of pay attention to the dynamics and, and how you think you may or may not want to change in the future um, yeah. if you were to do it again. Yeah, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And to be honest, and this is just like a, a thought that popped into my mind now, a lot of podcasts that I either get really into or not depends on the like the voice of the host, because I, I cannot tolerate and I guess my students pour them if I'm monotone in class, they have to tolerate me, but I can't really commit to a podcast where, you know, welcome to the podcast and nah, 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 you know, it, it doesn't For work. Sure. So I guess I'm already like thinking about that without knowing it. Ah, oh, crazy. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, number two, eye contact. I feel um, like it's pretty self-explanatory, but like, what are the, the, the concrete tips and tricks for this? 
So for sure, it is very self-explanatory, um, but it's also something we tend to struggle with. Um, and I'll just say we, the royal we. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, if you think back to your, your teachers at, at almost any level, um, when somebody's trying to engage an audience and they spend more time looking at their feet or looking at the ceiling or looking at their notes, Um, you are not as engaged as you can be. So um, I still maintain that voice is number one in most cases, um, but eye contact is a very close number two in that um, when you look at someone, even for a brief moment, they feel like you're talking to them. Um, And so you create that, those little micro connections. And I just say micro, um, not to diminish their importance, but just because they might only last a couple of seconds at a time. Now, when I have 200 students, um, I spend my lecture when I'm not looking at the screen, because I'm typing something. um, When I'm, when I'm talking to them, I make a point to make eye contact with everyone in the room, even if that means 200 people. So they're not, they're not getting my full attention, but they do get little slices of it. And I, I do believe that for those moments, it makes it feel like I'm talking to them, um, not, not as a group, but as individuals. And I think that that's a meaningful connection. Now, of course, that's much easier when I have a class of 30 or 15 or or something smaller, then I can spend more time making that eye contact or Mm -hmm. uh, it comes around more frequently, more repeatedly. But um, I I do believe that that's an extremely important engagement uh, technique is to make that eye contact. And again, we, we're not, always wired to do this as public speakers we do especially when we get nervous we want to look at the floor we want to look at the ceiling uh, we want to look anywhere but at the but, people that yeah. are scrutinizing <laughs> us um, mm-hmm. the people that are that are our our audience um, so what i recommend you do is try to look for the people that already appear to be engaged look at the people that are giving eye contact back at you right because um, it can be very reassuring you know, there's there's very little that's um, more discouraging than a room full of people that are not looking at you, uh, that are that are clearly distracted. So look at the people that are um, engaged with you. Uh, what I find often in my classes, and I think that this is, um, I don't know for sure, but I, I feel like this is kind of a high school and beyond sort of thing um i I tell people to look for the nodders and that's that's what i look for i look for the people that are nodding their head up and down just a little bit that are kind of saying yeah i get this or yeah this is going really well or you know i'm i'm into what's happening here and um i find those people very reassuring because it it kind of tells me that i'm not way off track that that something is going right uh, so when I'm trying to make eye contact, if I find that the room is largely distracted, I will look for those people that that are engaged and are kind of nodding their head. Um, and, and like your voice control, this is something that gets easier as time goes on. Um, and it, it is about building confidence and it's also about exuding confidence. Mm. You know, if you can, if you are in a position where you know your material and you can spend the time to make eye contact with your students or your audience, um, that's meaningful. It's funny because you were like, you know, look for the nodders and I'm sitting, you know, at my desk here and I'm just like nodding away to everything <laughs> that you're saying. And I like hands down am a nodder because I think because I've given, you know, different workshops and as a teacher, you're just like aware of how that person in front of everyone is feeling. So giving them eye contact, eye contact and nodding. Like I know if I'm up there and somebody's doing that to me, I appreciate it. So I just feel like being engaged and nodding and like smiling and, you know, showing the person that I'm engaged in what they're saying, it's always reassuring. So For sure. definitely check that off the list. You find that you're more, <laughs> you're more engaged when other people like give presentations now that, now that you're aware of like these techniques or? 
Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. Um, I suppose it also depends on the content. Like right. there there isn't any of this that allows us to escape the content. You know, if, mm-hmm. if students are 100% not into what you're talking about, there's very little you can do to engage them. And these six things are probably not, they're not going to make the difference. So, you know, if I end up in a seminar and I'm really not into the content, you know, um, will I nod occasionally? For sure. Um, Cause I know that it's, it's important that the speaker feels um like you're engaged but you know Mm -hmm. am i hard to say hard to say uh i've taught a lot of students and i know that i don't catch all of them um these are just tricks to try to bring more of them into the fold right i guess i just have a lot of empathy for like that person who you know probably put a lot of time into their presentation and like i know uh anyways that's like just my little heart that (laughs) no for sure for sure um i I do appreciate the nodders though they're they're an amazing group that that kind of (laughs) helps to keep you glued together when you're doing the eye contact thing yeah oh that's so good okay i'm gonna we're gonna do one more strategy and then we're gonna play a game because in this season of que sera sera, i've been trying to like add little games in between um our conversations <laughs> gamified it. i've gamified it <laughs> so we're gonna play a quick game after you tell us about um how audience involvement is one of the performance strategies Audience involvement, um, you know, I, I think of audience involvement like a magic show where um, I was lucky enough to see Penn and Teller perform in Las Vegas uh, one year. And I always find it fascinating when magicians will go into the audience and they pull out, um, you know, supposedly non uh, non-informed audience members who who are part of the trick, and it it's such an amazing um, thing when that happens because you know it, it it gives the opportunity for the magicians to go off script a little bit, and at the same time, the audience feels like they're part of the show even when they're not the ones that are called up to the stage. So whenever possible, um, I try to get my students involved. Um, in the show. I take a lot of flack from my colleagues for calling my class the show, but um, I only do that because of this teaching as performance thing. So um, to get my students involved in the show uh, beyond just answering questions, because they're always so nervous um, to answer something in front of their peers. But when I have the opportunity to do it, I will ask students to come up and you know participate in uh, a demonstration an example and i don't do many of these um i have to be and everybody that wants to do this needs to be a little bit careful um i never bring up somebody that hasn't volunteered um if somebody is very obviously uncomfortable i sort of um, ask them politely to sit back down and watch the rest of the demo. Um, this is this is one of the ones that you have to tread very very carefully on, um, because you don't actually want to make people uncomfortable. That's that's very counterproductive. Yeah. Um, but but when I do have these opportunities, and in computer science, there there's not a lot of them. It's not a it's not a shockingly human subject. So um, every once in a while, there'll be a particular topic that's complex enough and abstract enough that having some volunteers come up and play the role of um, little computer science-y things um, is appropriate. And they the, the students tend to really enjoy those particular lectures where their peers, um, or in some cases themselves, are part of what I'm doing. And it it is a connection that goes beyond just eye contact and and vocal dynamics because even those that don't get called up seem to feel like all of a sudden they're part of it and it's it's an interesting thing when the person that's sitting beside you gets called up and it isn't just the professor anymore that's in right. front of the class it's mm-hmm. it's somebody that's just like you you know, um, or or close enough to like you to to being just like you, that you sort of project and you feel like you were also part of the show, or at least you were represented um, in the show. And and they tend to they tend to sit up on the the edge of their seats a little bit more <laughs> and pay a little bit more attention, um, even if it's just for the fact that their friend is up there 
and they're kind of glad that it's not them in some cases. Yeah. So, so there, there's about a half a dozen cool things that are happening. Um, but I do want to reiterate, like it's, you have to be very careful. Um, and you know, you have to not put anybody in a position where they're going to be embarrassed or, um, where you or the students are going to regret the, uh, the interaction. You just, you just need to plan it out rather carefully. And at the first sign of trouble, you got to kind of either call it quits for an individual par- participant or for maybe the whole example and then try it again um, from another angle another time. Uh, but it is a really cool mm-hmm. effect when they're part of the quote unquote show um, and that everybody's sort of paying attention or, or in my case, again, at the university level, everybody's got their cell phone out filming it. And yeah, like that, that doesn't happen for regular lectures. <laughs> no. Well, oh my gosh, it becomes so much more of like, not like a learning moment that is more like concrete, but they have almost that like emotional tie to it. You know, they're like tying those emotions of, you know, their friend or, you know, somebody that they've seen before going, you know, up on quote unquote stage to do something and how they felt about that and feeling a part of it and breaking down those walls, Aaron. I love it. I love it so much. And like, One thing I just want to add to, to this example that, you know, it was making me think of, um, you as a professor, like you are in charge and control of your lectures and, you know, you have a certain plan. And when you have someone come up on stage, again, big quotation marks, you're almost like letting go a little bit of that control because you can't necessarily plan out on how they're going to do or what they're going to say or how they're going to react or, you know, so that's like obviously not easy for everyone to do. And maybe that's why people who would be like less comfortable in letting go of the reins a little bit might be more resistant to this, um, for, to this example, for, ex- for example. <laughs> oh, for sure. There's definitely an element of letting go. Um, and I think I am, and again, this, I, I can only speak from my own experience after, you know, 10 or 12 years I'm I'm just sort of now at the point where I know how to let go of that control and how to deal with it if something happens. Um, and that only comes through practice and it only comes uh, through time and experience. So um, I am at the point now where I plan roughly what I want to cover in content. And then I plan for things that I can't plan. And I think that's what these strategies do for me more than anything else is they give me the ability to cope when things don't go the way they do in my head when I'm sort right. of thinking about it the night before. Um, and I think that's where the value is. That's where the self-preservation is, um, you know, particularly when we talk about um, improvisation later on. Uh, that's that's all an artifact of what to do when the plan stops working. And it inevitably does. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, you ready to play a game? I'm ready. It's super simple. It's called This or That. Um, I don't know if you're going to hate the game or not. I don't know. I feel like you're nervous right now. I feel like you're a thinker and you're not going (laughs) to like this game. So essentially, I'm just going to give you two options and you're going to tell me which one you choose as of like personal preference. Do I have to tell Um, you why? No, we're not going to go in the why yet. You're just going to like. Like off the cuff? Is that a is that yeah. English? Yeah, yeah. Let's do off it. the cuff. Okay. Off the cuff. Off the cuff. Whatever. I you wish know. I had planned for this. Exactly my point. <laughs> okay. We're gonna start with some easy ones. I think I have like, I don't know, six or seven here. We'll go through okay. them and then we can like chat about them quickly after and then I'm ready. end with the uh, the three other strategies. So this or that. Coffee or tea? Oh, tea. Oh. <laughs> giving an early class or a late class early would you rather have grades or go gradeless oh oh that's so mean uh (laughs) gradeless uh mario or luigi ah this is horrible um (laughs) luigi um xbox or playstation playstation Sega or Nintendo? Nintendo. And would you rather (laughs) pre-order online or wait in line? 
Oh, gross. Pre-order online. There we go. You survived. <laughs> was that like the most painful thing you've done all week? <laughs> oh, some of those are hard because the like the tea and coffee, um, you know, it depends on the day. Of course. If I, if I really need a jolt of caffeine, then it's coffee. But, you know, if I have something warm to drink in the morning, 10 days out of, you know, out of 10 days, nine of them will be tea for sure. Um, so, so that kind of, that kind of question is tough. Mario and Luigi, you know, it depends on what I'm playing for sure. <laughs> um, but PlayStation versus Xbox, like that's easy. That's a no brainer. That's a no brainer. Do yeah. you want to explain the the grades or grade list thing? I feel like you just oh. had, there was so much passion in there that <laughs> needed to like come out. Yeah. The problem with that one is I've really wanted to go grade list for some time now, but um I don't know if this is particularly a university thing, but it's it the structures are are not really there. Um, we talk a lot about the freedom we have as instructors at the post secondary level, particularly in in, in uh, universities where uh, we tend to be covered by a, a fairly decent academic freedom um, clause in a lot of our collective agreements. So we actually have a lot of options in, in terms of what we can do in the classroom, which is nice. Cause that's how I get to play with some of these things like performance. Um, but going gradeless, like there are so many institutional barriers um, to being able to, to tell a universe, uh, uh, 200 university computer science mm -hmm. students, you know, you're not actually going to receive a grade, um, for this course. Like it's, there's a lot of a lot of walls that need to come down before I feel like that would be a, a an actual feasible thing for for me to do in my job. But I'm I'm utterly fascinated mm -hmm. by the idea of it, and um, there are times, particularly when I'm neck deep in grading, and I'm questioning, you know, is this a meaningful evaluation of my students' performance right. that I would love to go gradeless. So in theory, I think it's a wonderful idea, but there's a lot of barriers, um, particularly, I think, at the post-secondary level um, to being able to do that. Well, hey, let first of all, let's like break down those walls together one by one. Um, <laughs> but sure. secondly, the problem in, you know, our high schools is that my students need, need grades to get into your post-secondary. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I don't know. Are we working for or against each other? I don't know. But yeah. Uh, and I, I have actually attended a couple of seminars by, um, I guess, primary, uh, primary teachers, that have gone gradeless. So, yeah. you know, there there is a precedent that it is happening. Um, I would love to see 10 years from now, 15 years from now, uh, where some of this stuff is leading because uh, I, I think we're going to get there. Me too, because there's yeah. like small ways that you can go gradeless without, you know, not giving a whole grade until, you know, the end of the semester. But anyways, yeah. that's for a whole nother podcast. Let's <laughs> look at how pop culture can help your teaching performance and uh, what happens Aaron if I know nothing about pop culture right so the, <laughs> I think that the following three I think the last three are actually the ones that give people the worst anxiety in terms of whether or not they can do this so it, it's funny to say that you know what if I don't know pop culture I would argue that you do um, I would say that you possibly just don't know the same pop culture as your students. And <laughs> that's that's where people tend to get worried. Uh, the nice part is that they'll they'll often think it's cute and charming when we give our own pop culture references. Uh, yeah. I still I still do a lot of referencing Star Wars, Star Trek, Back to the Future. Um, you know, My Little Pony is a classic that that never seems to go away. Um, but to be honest, and this is what we talk about in the in the presentation, pop culture. I think is moving a lot faster than it than it ever has. And, you know, with the introduction of memes and, you know, now there's TikToks and mm -hmm. Vines and all sorts of uh, media that's very short, very digestible, um, but also easily forgotten and moved beyond within a matter of weeks. Um, that it's actually really hard to stay on top of pop culture and people... Uh, people are pretty happy to come up to me after the talk and say, you know, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to, 
I'm not going to binge watch everything that's available on Netflix. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm not going to watch all the TikToks. I'm not going to um, download everything on Spotify that I can get my hands on. And that's fair. Of um, I totally, I totally understand that. Uh, what I counter with is let the students guide you a little bit. Let them uh, like be receptive to their pop culture as long as it isn't insulting, as long as it isn't derogatory. Um, you know, let them guide you on this part uh, if need be, and and be sort of open minded to it. One of the things that I did, and and not everybody's going to be able to do this, but we have a, a learning management system that we use at Laurentian. And most universities and colleges will, and, and a lot of high schools um, are starting to incorporate things like this as well. Um, I let the students do a thread of memes on the discussion forum where um, I, it may not come across when we're only talking every once in a while for an hour, but I have a very tangential mind and I'll be talking about something in computer science and all of a sudden I'm I'm talking about something I watched on Netflix, um, you know, three months ago that relates to um, the topic at hand, the, the subject, the content. And the students are, are just kind of sitting there going like, why are we all over the map here? Like in a, in a, in a cute, charming sort of way. And what they want to do is they want to express themselves, but they don't want to raise their hand and say, you know, this is kind of weird or, um, you know, why are you talking about this in this way? And so what they'll do is they'll make a meme of it and they will post that into the meme thread. And it's a really interesting way for me to collect up some of the weirder, more obscure (laughs) examples that I do in class. But it also is an indicator to me that they are, in fact, paying attention Uh, that, you know, as much as you think you want to think as a teacher, like, did you get a single word of what I said? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting feedback mechanism that says, you know, at the very least, you got some obscure reference to an analogy of something that I was talking about. Um, And it, it allows them to express themselves in a way that they're very comfortable. It allows them to bring that pop culture that they like um, into the lecture. And it's another way of tearing those, those barriers down. And I don't, I don't always understand what they're posting. Uh, but I don't have to either because it's for them as a group. And I'm just sort of an observer. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm the content generator ultimately with my weird way Hmm. of, of processing the world. But at the same time, um, it allows them another gateway in to the lectures and to having a a feedback mechanism that is a little bit unusual. And so these meme threads tend to grow rather large over the term. Um, And it's really fun to go back and look at them and even to try to decipher what I was trying to say in a a strange example. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's a really neat connection mechanism that um, when I first allowed them to do it, became very clear that they were very interested in this. Mm-hmm. You've posted some really good ones too. I I can like remember scrolling through your Twitter and being like, oh my gosh, like what are these crazy memes? But were you yeah. ever like worried? I think it goes back to letting go of that control or, or giving them the chance, like, are they going to say something mean about me? Or, you know, are they going to be inappropriate? Or like, were you right. ever worried about like, how did you manage that? I don't know. Um, they are adults too. At the same time, you're not working with like Right. So mine are a bit different. But, yeah. Um, but I still hold them to the same kind of standards. Like I make it very clear. I don't, nothing derogatory will, will fly. You can't be insulting or, or intentionally mean. And I do, I do police the threads to a limited degree. Again, I give my students a little bit more leeway because of their age and and where they are in their educational journey. Um, But I don't, I don't tolerate anything that's, that's mean um, or mean spirited, but I also don't have very many that, that come across as mean, like they know the spirit in Mm -hmm. which it's, it's meant to be, to be done. Um, The other thing that people can do in terms of pop culture is, you know, even just throwing an animated GIF up 
um, or GIF, if, if you have listeners that prefer that instead. Um, we, that's another <laughs> yes. podcast. That's a whole other thing. Oh, oh um, my God. But, you know, throwing those things in from time to time in a presentation, um, just to catch them off guard, using emoji every yeah, once in a while. I've done little, like, like um, you know, like, what emoji are you feeling like this morning kind of thing, and then sure. having them vote. And, um, like, I don't know if you use Bitmoji. But I they love seeing my bitmojis yeah. and mm-hmm. also like hashtags. I, I seen that on your presentation. Yeah. And, and those are all forms of pop culture that don't mm. require you to binge watch Stranger Things season three um, to keep up with them. You know, it, it's, it doesn't have to be like you don't have to be an expert on Drake or Lizzo or, um, you know, whoever else is is in the top 40 right now. You just have to find small little doorways into the way that they're communicating with each other. Um, and in a lot of cases, those are uh, animated pictures um, <laughs> and emojis and hashtags and that can be a great start um, and then they'll fill in the rest they'll if you give them the opportunity if you give them the forum they'll they'll tell you what they're into do you think that because you can almost like create that that relationship with them through pop culture that they see you more as um, <laughs> like a person or, yeah you know yeah. and less as just like this huge like nerdy professor that sits and reads and studies and you know drinks his tea right. all the time but i don't i don't think there's a lot of us that are 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 just that person you know we we are we are sort of by definition um you know in front of the room in in that sort of nerdy professor place um all of us sort of by default but a lot of us also have interests outside of that and bringing those interests in, even if it's a contrast to what they're doing in pop culture, makes you seem more real. Um, and, and, and pop culture scares people because they're afraid that they're going to seem uncool. Uh, they're, <laughs> they're afraid that rather than pulling it off and, and seeming hip and yeah. trendy, that they're actually going to seem you know, archaic and that their, their memes are going to be stale and that it's, it's not going to work out. And I I guess my point is if you're already trying these things, um, you know, you probably have a a certain amount of self-confidence to even attempt these things. It can be actually quite um, an experience to do the uncool things and to laugh along with them at, at your own um, unknowledge of what's what's hot on Netflix and what's hot on Spotify. Um, mm-hmm. It can still be a way for you to connect with them and, and let them, this is where you get back to letting them fill you in on what they're interested in. Even if you don't know what it is, like I'm, I'm not up to date on all the most popular video games, but I do let my students talk about it. And I, I try to bring myself into the fold where I can. Um, but I, I make it as a way for them to express themselves more than I'm worried about. Am I into the exact same things that they mm-hmm. are? Um, mm-hmm. and, and one of the things that teachers have that most professions don't is our audience never gets any older um oh. our audience uh, and this is you know, mind one blowing of those, one what? of those mildly depressing things about <laughs> teaching is that we get older but our students don't now we might change grades you know depending on what we teach or you know i have a range of first year to fourth year but for the most part my students don't change what changes or sorry they don't they don't age what changes is trends change um, and I continue to get older. And so I don't, am am I on top of everything that the students are doing? No, absolutely not. And so I'm at a phase in my career where my pop culture references are often, you know, two or three decades before some of these students were born, Um, but they still work in a way that says, I am interested in things outside of the classroom technology or the classroom curriculum. um, And I am actually a real person. So, you know, it's it's not, it's not something to be as afraid of as, as people tend to be. I like that you said, you know, 
you allow them the opportunity and the chance to talk about, you know, what they're interested in and, and you make it less about you and what you don't know and more about them and what, you know, they're doing in the moment. And so not being a, like self-conscious or whatever about what you, what you don't know and just exuding confidence in what you do know. And, and if you uh, try to approach it and, and being scared of, you know, like, kind of like you said, being nerdy or being not cool in the way you present it, well, you're probably not going to be cool in the way you present it. Like you have to, you, you almost have to like, you have to own it. You have to own it. Thank you. I, yeah. I had the French word in my head and I was like, il faut l'assumer, il faut l'assumer. Yeah. How do we say that? You have to own it. Yeah. Um, and then I think you tied really nicely into the fifth strategy when you said that sometimes you just need to like laugh about your, like about yourself and your, 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 your lack of knowledge sometimes. And that, you know, it's, it's humor and it starts kind of uh, not with like, self-sabotaging yourself but i don't know how, how do you go about um, that humor is again I, I i have to repeat that the last three points um you know pop culture humor and improvisation are the ones that i get the most criticism on or the ones that people are most scared of and and there's a reason for that humor when done every one of the last three when done really poorly um is is bad you know, um, getting yes. all of your pop culture wrong and not owning it is bad. Getting your humor wrong um, can be quite devastating. And there are a lot of people that'll simply say, like, just like I say, I can't sing. There are a lot of people that'll stand up and say, well, I'm, I'm not funny. And that's totally fair. And I don't, I, I, I would never want some, I would never want to tell somebody, you know, just just go in and tell jokes for an hour and a half or 45 minutes or however long your your class is because that's that's not the point at all um with humor um what i try to do with humor is to remind the students that we don't have to be 100 percent serious all the time that even though you know we are working towards the goal of a degree in the case of a university setting. You don't have to just be laser focused 100% of the time that it's okay to laugh. And I think um, when I first started dealing with humor, laughing at myself was one of those key preservation strategies because until I learned to laugh at my own mistakes, my own hiccups, my own you know, whatever it was that was going wrong at the time, they would laugh before I did. And I became very embarrassed, very self-conscious, very aware of, of the things that I was doing wrong. Um, but when I let go of that and learned to laugh at, at the absurdity of whatever was happening at the moment, um, it became very liberating. So my humor um, came from a place of wanting to make sure that I didn't seem like I was taking things too seriously. I didn't want it to seem that if the projector wasn't working properly or if my laptop died because I forgot to plug it in all the way, that that was something that I, I needed to be upset or angry or frustrated about, right. that we couldn't just shrug it off and laugh about it and go, well, that didn't really work out. Um, so, so humor for me actually started as little pieces of very much self-awareness in terms of this isn't actually that big of a deal and and we we can recover from this and go on quite easily um in time uh i think i became a little bit jokier i i found i started to find the humor in the content i started to find the humor in the interactions i was having with my students um and and there are moments where my lectures do become uh, something of a stand-up routine and it's not it's not in an effort to uh, take away from the content it's just a reminder to everyone again that you know we can laugh we can we can be serious we can learn but we can also laugh um, and and it doesn't take away from what we're doing and in some cases it can diffuse a lot of unnecessary tension 
uh, whether or not mm-hmm. it's a difficult topic that we're going through, whether or not I'm giving them uh, the lecture after a, a poorly written test. Um, it's the little things. It, it's another sort of wall between the seriousness of who I am supposed to be to them right. in front and who I actually am, which is a person that's like, you know what, whatever it is, X, Y, or Z isn't working. Let's laugh about it. And let's move on. Um, I am also very careful in my talk to say like, don't, don't ever do dark humor. Don't belittle somebody. Don't tease somebody unnecessarily. Not, not that there's necessary reasons to tease people. Um, always, always keep it more from a place of joy and a, and a place of honesty, whether or not um, it's it's you that you're talking about or an interaction with a student. Uh, make sure that it's always about the light in the room, not the dark. Mm. Uh, I, I don't, I don't do dark humor. Uh, it's never, uh, it's never a good thing in this kind of a situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, and you do have to be careful. You have to be very careful. And one of the critiques I've gotten, and it's completely fair, um, at, at university, you know, we have a lot of international students. And one of the questions is, do they understand the pop culture references? Do they understand the humor? Um, so there are a lot of things to be concerned about when you're doing, when you're incorporating humor. Um, and, and again, going back to something we said a couple of times, None of the humor really works until you are a master of the content, um, like telling right. you're, you're not actually up there to be a comedian. Uh, <laughs> you have to you have to make sure that they learn something. Um, but once you're once you're solid with the content, and once you've got voice dynamics and once you've got eye contact, then you can start to play around with these things. Um, and it, it can be as simple as I'll give you an example. When. When I ask questions of my uh, of my class, every once in a while, I'll ask them something specifically to stump them. Like I want them to think really hard um, or I'll ask them something of a trick question just to see if they're paying attention. Um, and so over time, they'll get a little bit skeptical and they won't want to answer. They'll they'll hesitate. <laughs> and so one of the one of the things I do that I, I think is humorous is I will I'll look at my 200 students, none of whom are putting their hand up, and I'll say, don't worry, everyone, this isn't a trick question. You'll know it's a trick question when I do this. And I open my eyes really big and I wiggle my eyebrows in sort of a, you know, a, a comical way so that they know that I'll give them a clear signal when it's a trick question, which I, clearly I won't. So it's kind of a, a cheeky, oh sarcastic, yes, you know, yes. kind of thing. But even something as simple as that can get <laughs> half of half of the two hundred people chuckling. Yeah. Um, and then Aww. and then that tension of is this a trick question is immediately diffused, and then you can go on and say, okay, now let's really take a look at this. So it, it's not about it, it's not about weaving pop culture narratives like a stand up comedian would do. It's just a matter of saying, you know what, we there's more light in the room than you realize. Let's take advantage of some of it. And here's a here's a funny little quip that'll remind you that we're all kind of in this together. Um, it is it is tricky for some people, and that's totally fair. And I know a lot of my colleagues will include comics. They'll download comic strips and they'll put them at the end of the test, or they'll put them on an assignment. And you know, it can be as simple as looking up joke of the day and posting mm-hmm. it to your discussion forum or your news feed or whatever it is that you happen to be using in class. And it, it is just that that simple reminder that while we are doing serious work, we don't actually have to be serious all the time. I think the most comforting thing in that whole strategy was you uh, almost like indirectly saying that humor is something that you can work on. It's not something that you either have or you don't. I don't think I would necessarily have ever considered myself like a very humorous person. Like I'm very lighthearted and, you know, can crack a joke here and there when I'm like really feeling it. But otherwise, I don't know. I think just the way that you laid it out, it seemed a lot more simple and attainable to be quote unquote humorous. Yeah. And the trick is to start small, start with what you know, start with what you're comfortable with. Um, Don't, 
don't lay awake at the night before a class <laughs> trying to figure out how you're going to make you know, a, a, a Netflix style comedy special out of your lecture the next morning oh or your, your class, because that's, that's not what we're there for. But if you can, if you can turn a phrase or throw a pun out there yes. um, that the whole room gets, or if you can just wiggle your eyebrows and say like, this isn't actually a trick question, um, <laughs> that that's meaningful. And it shows that you care um, right. about their anxiety and their, and their comfort well yeah. and their, and, and that they're comfortable in the room. Oh, just when you, when you explain that example, I felt like immediately calm, you know, when you <laughs> no, for real. And I think like, as a student, like I reflect back and think back of myself as a student who, you know, never want to get a question wrong and always wanted to be right and didn't want to look silly in front of, you know, my my peers like having a, a teacher say that like would have definitely comforted me so yeah. i tip my hat to you <laughs> um it's a lot of practice <laughs> well improvisation must be a lot of practice too because by looking at your slides it looks like you do uh, a style of whose lines whose lines anyways in your no, you just, know and your gamification I just stole class that <laughs> No, that picture just came from the internet. But I, I do think it's a good analogy. The yeah. whose line is it anyway with Ryan Stiles and Colin Mockery. Oh and, my. Um, Drew Carey was, was the host of the US version. Um, and I used to watch that show and I was just in awe of, you know, they would give them five words to work from and they'd have a 15 minute sketch mm. uh, or, or whatever it was, a five minute sketch. And it, it just, their ability to react to any situation it was something that was mesmerizing to me and, and just captured my interest. And the reason that I have it in these slides is uh, something that we talked about earlier. Things go off the rails. Um, you know, it, it happens to me almost every lecture. There's, there's very few, there's very few times that things go exactly the way that they, they're supposed to in my head from start to finish in a one and a, in a one and a half hour lecture. And the improvisation is pretty much for me the combination of everything that we've talked about. It's it's all five. Oh, here's a good analogy. Yeah. It's all five lions of Voltron that come together to form the giant robot. Is that working? Some of your yeah. listeners will get that. That's I'm... amazing. So <laughs> it's like all five of the other things come together to form improvisation, you know, and it's a matter of if things fall off the rails, how do you recover? Do you stand there feeling panicked and very clearly looking panicked? And, and it happens, don't, don't get me wrong, I have spent many, many moments in class being panicked, um, but at a certain point, um, I started tying all of these pieces together and figuring out ways to bridge that gap between what went wrong and how to get back on track. Um, and and it, it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It can be as simple as, you know, a, a body gesture and a laugh and a quick remark about what happened. But the idea is, um, how do you respond to a situation that you didn't anticipate? And that's what improvisation really is. The, the idea is that you, you don't anticipate what the next sketch is going to be about and you have mm. to make it up as you go along. So what are you going to do um, in those instances where maybe you get a question from a student that you weren't anticipating? How are you going to respond to that? And, and the improvisation in this case doesn't mean that you um, have to do something hilarious in, in the whose line is it anyway style. Yeah. But it means, do you have enough of these pieces put together that you can come up with a response on the fly to a question that you did not anticipate? Um, can you deal with a situation that, you know, maybe the technology in your classroom doesn't work? What are you going to do in that case? Um, maybe, you know, maybe you thought everybody was going to get an example and they didn't. How are you going to uh, react to that? So improvisation is about 90% confidence. 
Uh, and that that's one of the hardest things for us to develop. But it does come in time. And the more confident you are, again, about the content, and then also about your ability to sort of patch over that rough spot, then you get this sense of improvising the things that didn't go the way that you thought they were going to go. Um, so it, it's, it's not it's not about necessarily humor, pop culture right. completely. It's about the ability to react. Hmm. Improv to react. We need to almost like build that muscle with our students too, because if we can like almost, I don't want to say like put them on the spot so that they have to, you know, like improvise either. But if we started building that muscle, like when they were in elementary school and in high school, Mm -hmm. they would feel more comfortable as adults when they're put into these situations, you know, than us. Like I always avoided improv when I was in elementary (laughs) school and like it gave me major anxiety before I even knew what like anxiety was. Um, But now it's something that I, I can honestly say that I have welcomed with open arms, like especially in the first few years of my teaching. And I'm almost like, man, I wish I would have practiced these, you know, like techniques or, or, you know, built that confidence before I had no choice to, you know what I mean? Yeah, and and I think there's a couple of points. Sometimes we don't develop it until we have to. Mm, that kind of goes back fair. to remember yeah. remember when we were talking about listening to your own voice so that you could yeah. do better at vocal <laughs> dynamics. You know, nobody's going to do that until they feel like they have to do that. Um, the other thing that that comes to mind uh, with what you were saying is that in a lot of cases we actually are already doing these things as teachers, as instructors. Um, we're already um, improv- improvising, even if we're not quite aware of it. You know, like how are we going to respond to things when things go bad uh, or or go unexpectedly? And and so we have certain baseline coping mechanisms. I think the important part for our discussion is how can you go above the baseline? How can you not sweat those couple of drops on your forehead but instead maybe maybe you work on your pop culture a little bit so that you can use those references to bridge a weird gap in something that happens maybe uh maybe you do something with your voice to to help you recover from an unexpected situation you know it's about taking those performance related Mm -hmm. skills and applying them to the things that we're probably already doing Um, And again, I didn't realize how much of this I was doing until I had those reflective moments about, oh, yeah, like I I'm already doing this now. How can I do it better? And I think that was a really big turning point in my confidence as an instructor and in my ability to capture my students attention, which hopefully I do to a decent level. Yeah, well, holy moly, I reflecting on all of this i think that this whole episode has or will allow our educators listening to kind of like evaluate where they're at on each of these different strategies and elements and and the levels of which you know using our voice and the humor and the pop culture references and so whether our listeners are, you know, at the faculty of education, or maybe a new teacher like me, or maybe they're a veteran teacher or an ed tech coach or a principal or a, you know, a professor. Like, I think that everyone who is in the field, they can have so many takeaways from this, um, like from this chat that we just had. So I want to make sure that before we go, that you can um, just share your information on how anyone listening can contact you to like know more or chat more about this? Um, I would think the easiest way to get a hold of me for your people that are on social media would be through Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, so my handle is at Aaron, A-A-R-O-N underscore 
L-U-C-S, so it stands for Laurentian University Computer Science. Um, the other way to get a hold of me would be to look up my email address on the Laurentian University website uh, because I'm the only Aaron listed, so I'm actually pretty easy to find. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Um, again, I'm well aware that this is a controversial, and, and I use that term in the in kind of the lightest sense, uh, kind of a controversial topic. I know that there are a lot of educators that don't feel that you know the edutainment way of 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 teaching is necessarily the right way or the right way for them um but i also think that there are a lot of people that might find this to be a a, a way to reach their students at a different level so um if anybody wants to talk about one way or the other i'm i'm happy to talk about it yes well Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time tonight to speak with me because I know that as educators, as instructors, as teachers, our time and just like our energy in general are our most valuable resources. So I just want to remind and, and finish by saying that in this big, beautiful world of education, we give what we can, we do what we can, and for the rest, que sera, sera. Kesara Sara is a proud member of the Voice Ed Radio Network. Original music, editing, and production of this podcast is done by the talented Mathieu Leroux. Find my podcast on all podcast platforms, including SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and now newly on YouTube. Talk to you soon.